Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very, very excited to um, have Guillaume join us today. Um, apart from being one of the leading thinkers and creators um, in the product space, um, he's been championing the sustainability agenda. Over time, we've got to know each other and become friends. What I like about Guillaume's approach to challenges that are facing him, his business, his industry, is the pragmatism and the practicality of it. Not a utopian dream of achieving something that will face a lot of hurdles, but taking the hurdles out of it and making sustainability economical. So without further ado, I introduce Guillaume. Um, uh, he leads um, supplies business for HP. Um, as you all know, HP happens to be one of the leaders in the printing business, not just technology, but as well as market share out there. So for somebody to challenge their own business model to address some of the sustainability elements of it, I thought this would be one of the coolest stories to share. I personally have become a big fan of the story. So I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna ask Guillaume to please come in and share with everybody, what's the background? How did this happen? You don't just wake up one day and say, yep, I had a dream and now I'm gonna become sustainable. So tell us about your journey because you are a product company and it's very difficult to change a product, especially when you are well entrenched, you are the leader. That's kind of like, you know, redefining who you are. So Guillaume, um, please tell us everybody, how did this journey unfold before we get into the nitty gritties of the how, the what, and uh, the successes you are seeing and the challenges you are facing? Thank you, Bart. Um, I, I, I'm gonna start by, uh, by uh, saying a big thank you to you for, uh, for inviting me to this session and for, for the great partnership with uh, yourself and, and Kearney. I, I think it's been, uh, it's been really great over the past year. And I think you've been um, uh, supporting me extraordinarily to, uh, to drive this vision that, and transformation that uh, I have on back my, my business at HP. So to introduce uh, myself a, a little further, uh, I'm the general manager for uh, print supplies business at, uh, at HP. And, um, and I've been working with Barat uh, and, and, and a lot of other people, Eric Gervais at Kearney, on, uh, on the transformation of the business uh, with a vision for 2030. Uh, and, and a core attribute of it is to design the business uh, and re-architect it um, with uh, sustainability as a, as a priority. And, um, and I think I'd like to step back on answering your question right now on uh, explaining a little bit the, the journey that the company HP has been through. I think if you think about the, uh, the, the, the genesis of HP and what has been done, it's been, it's been a company with its brand value to be also uh, thinking about its social impact and its impact on the world. It's been the constituent of the, uh, of the founders. So it's been a lot of... Uh, 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 contribution over, over time to, uh, to the world, to sustainability. In fact, we have a, a planet partner program, a recycling program already for 30 years, uh, since 1991. And, uh, uh, but what you have observed by that is, uh, I think, a recent, uh, a recent evolution and, and a shift. And it, I, I think it's quite significant uh, what we are now looking at um, in I would summarize it that instead of uh, just uh, uh, making sustainability as one of the priorities, as one of the elements to uh, support as part of a business objective, what really the, uh, is at stake now from my side with this business and HP uh, is, is moving in this direction is that actually it's, it's core to, uh, to how we set the strategy. And so, so actually sustainability is becoming, I probably uh, wouldn't say a business, but it, it has to make business sense. And what we found is that actually when you think about sustainability differently um, and um, make, making it a, a core element of your strategy and you see the potential that you can, you can make a better business, uh, making it sustainable. And, um, and, and so 
uh, how it concretely uh, materializes in uh, in my business is uh, uh, for instance we are we've been launching a new product in France most recently in December and uh, that product is the most sustainable toner cartridge that uh, HP ever did and the particularity of it that in the past we were looking at <clears throat> what we can what we can do to further reduce materials what we can do to to increase the uh, uh, the percentage of recycled materials into the product um, what we can do to reuse some components and basically two, two years ago uh, with my team we said well I think we need to change this approach which is purely incremental to really thinking about how can we make the most sustainable product optimizing across all uh, all the tools that that we have and and really activating all the engineering and technology that we have and we came up with this product called EvoCycle which is actually produced in France yeah it's produced in France in a in a, in a recycling center so we are combining uh, the return of our cartridges used cartridges and what is happening in that same site uh, we are uh, uh, processing those return cartridges to uh, make sure that we can maximize the reuse of components and for those that are not meeting the quality standards uh, that we need for our customers we are recycling them so they go through a, a shredding process and being recycled and then at the end at the end of the site we are producing a cartridge which is the most sustainable in uh, uh, toner cartridge in the market our customers love it um, we uh, uh, obviously are very happy to uh, make uh, our customer happy, but on top of that, we are very happy to create a process, uh, a, a, uh, an end-to-end -end circular system locally uh, that, uh, that has a huge benefit to the, uh, to the environment in terms of reducing carbon emissions. So that's just an example of many of the transformation that is at stake where we're basically now designing our products to be, uh, uh, let's say, optimizing their sustainable performance and, uh, and really uh, moving away from just a pure incremental approach to really redesigning the product and the entire process. Because what I explained with this, with this uh, example is it's redesigning the supply chain. This product was, was uh, produced in Asia before. So we are doing it for uh, in France for the EU and um, and uh, as we see the success with it as we see that actually our customers love it um, and we can make a, a, a scalable process then we are looking at expanding this and I can explain some further examples but I, I thought this one would be would be interesting to actually understand the type of uh, transformation that is at stake. Thank you, Guillaume. This is pretty awesome. Um, and I've heard this story several times. I'm glad uh, uh, rest of the folks get to hear it too. But I want to kind of like, you know, untangle this, um, some of the things you said, right? Like think differently, the two-year journey. And something you didn't say, you guys are super anal about quality. And when we talk about recycling, uh, you know, reusing and all, sometimes people associate that with second grade or, you know, uh, quality degradation and all. So talk a little bit more about what do you really mean by think differently? And, you know, how does this team, you know, a super talented team in just two years go from an idea to actually a very successful, and by, by my term, successful means you guys are happy because you are making money and your customers are happy because they are happy spending their money with you. How does that happiness happen while you do not degrade your standards? Yeah, it's an it's an excellent question. I actually uh, uh, is that miraculous? Is that luck, or is that really? Uh, 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 I think it's a lot of hard work. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the uh, uh, I also think that, uh, that the engineers that we have at HP are, are excellent. And when you you actually uh, explain to them um, a goal so inspiring as hey, create a product and a, and a process and a system that is going to solve uh, an important problem for the world. Because everything that we do 
I'm not going to say it uh, uh, could be treated arrogantly, but as a leader in this industry, when we do something like this as HPE, we emulate uh, the industry to do the same. So the, the engineers in, in, at HP realize that, oh, with this challenge, I can actually not only create a cool product, but change this industry. And that, I think, I mean, it's human nature. We get inspired by that. And I think it became actually quite easy for me as a leader and, and a lot of people in, in, in the company to, uh, to uh, uh, get people to work on this. And you, you see amazing energy, amazing uh, creativity. And we also get our customers to tell us what they want, what they need, and they feel like they are contributing to the output as well. So in fact, when you, uh, when you are uh, creating an inspiring goal, and uh, um, and it's the more challenges it, challenging it is, actually, the more inspiring it becomes when it touches something that people are very sensitive about, um, and and you create an immense creativity that uh, I I wouldn't believe was possible even when we started. Uh, so I got back from the team in the space of one year. They developed this product end to end. So we started with an idea, we started with a, a workshop, et cetera. And then when I said, well, we're gonna do this. And then in one year, uh, not only the product was designed, uh, but uh, was ready for production ultimately to test it, et cetera. And as you said, Barad, it's one of the key uh, uh, condition was no compromise on quality. Well, HP quality must be uh, intact. Whatever we do, we're going to make a better product for the environment, a much better product for the environment, and we are, we can, uh, we are going to uh, make it of the same quality. And yeah, you have the beauty of your uh, R&D teams and partnership also with our uh, uh, manufacturer, with recycling centers. I mean, uh, you, you actually, it's, it becomes relatively easy to create alliances and partnership and rally the teams when you have such an inspiring goal. So I encourage everybody to look at very bold and uh, ambitious goals because uh, you, 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 you can engage your team with that and you can engage a lot of key partners to, uh, to make it happen. Guillaume, seems like you read my mind. I was going to ask you a question. How would you explain to everybody else who wants to get on this journey? So we all know every firm is trying to put their 2030 goals out there. They all understand it's important. But you know, having a goal and then maybe even creating inspiration is more, I would say, a soft effort or a soft skill. But now when the rubber hits the road, it's the execution, the grease, the, the bearings and the machines and everything, the supply chains, the channels, the customers and everything you got, including you know, the ad campaigns you got to run. So help us understand how was this journey for you over this two year period? How do you take this inspiring story with great talent out there, but actually make it really tactical and really happen? And if I may say, you know, uh, what are the five steps, the seven steps or the 11 steps to really making it happen? And, you know, having the conviction behind it that whatever decisions we are making are going in the right direction. Sometimes it becomes analysis paralysis. You never move. But that was not the case. You guys actually moved. You guys put something together. You let the customers touch, feel, experience it. And now you have feedback. Um, it's, um, uh, I think, um, yeah, I, um, let me try to, to answer this question in, uh, in terms of explaining the different milestones and, uh, and structure a little bit the, the thought process. But I think we can, again, I would step back in saying, um, we were uh, somewhat looking at sustainability in this business, like, uh, well, we are trying to meet regulations, we are trying to uh, adjust our business to become more sustainable over time. But uh, in my mind and minds of my, my team that we were missing something, in fact. Uh, so how can we create a competitive advantage? How can we create something that will be satisfying for our customers? So we needed to change the paradigm. We realized quite quickly, we need to change the paradigm. We have to think different, not, not just incrementally. 
So that was the first step, but realizing that if really we want to make it uh, a competitive advantage, and, uh, uh, and that requires that our customers love it. Uh, and if you want to make sustainability sustainable, it has to make business sense. Uh, if it doesn't make business sense, it's, it's just a marketing message somewhere and that you hope somebody will uh, uh, appreciate it. But in fact, if you want sustainability to be sustainable, you have to make it uh, to, to, uh, to make business sense out of it. Um, and, and that was really um, became kind of our guiding principle. That was one step. And then after a while, it says, uh, okay, wh wh what does it mean um, uh, for our toner products, taking about supplies or our ink product, products? So we, uh, I explained this, what happened with toner, but in parallel to that, uh, we are moving, uh, we're changing our business model to become more services oriented. So we, we run also a pilot to test uh, uh, a, new, a new product similar to the ones that explains uh, in Toner, but for Inc. Uh, to support uh, 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 our services business and basically asking our directly our customers, hey, what about, what if we would give you a more uh, sustainable product with these attributes, would you like to contribute to the pilot? And we needed about 300 customers. In, it was in Germany. And uh, we had to stop because too many customers were opting in uh, for the pilot, for the pilot, not knowing what products we will deliver to them, but just promising to them, hey, don't worry, we're going to make it good quality. And we've run that process, uh, that pilot for about a year now. and. It's a, again, it's a very similar process. We are renewing, uh, using, reusing components, recycling overs in a, in a local end-to-end -end system, circular system, closed loop system. It's been working, we've tested the quality. Uh, we've iterated, we've learned through that. We've learned that customers uh, would like to do more. Customers uh, appreciate, uh, would like to understand their uh, contribution to, uh, to uh, um, uh, to the environment through that process. Um, so we are testing a number of things uh, throughout the pilot and we are taking the learning. And, uh, and then as uh, we understand the quality, the cost structure uh, uh, impact, then we are now in a phase of identifying how we can scale. We can scale that example in France, we can scale that example uh, that I was just quoting in Germany um, and uh, developing a strategy to be able to scale. So that's kind of phase three. So first one was, hey, we need to change our paradigm. Uh, phase, phase two, let's develop pilots that are going to help us understand what may work. And as we run this pilot, we take the learning, that's, that's kind of a phase three. And phase four is now, how do we scale this? Because we see the potential we understand how these pilots have been working. Um, and the impact, we've basically checked the box on multiple criteria. And now we're looking at scaling this and how much can we transform the entire portfolio on the basis of this pilot. Um, so yeah, I think that those are, I, I, I think some of, the, some of the key steps. And then in parallel to that, uh, uh, we continue to develop uh, strategies to uh, really uh, optimize our, uh, our, our sustainability tools. Uh, the video that you were showing at the beginning was showing these plastic bottles that we are recycling. Um, in fact, we, we do, uh, we upcycle about 1 million plastic bottles a day. And, uh, and they are taken out of the ocean and they are uh, 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 recycled and upcycled into new cartridges. And they are used into these pilots that I was mentioning. Um, and so it's a, we have to organize the entire supply chain from, hey, how do we make sure our customers can return cartridges so that we can reuse some components, add some new recycled materials to it. Some of it will come from these plastic bottles you saw. And, and then, uh, uh, sorry. And then um, uh, 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 make new products uh, and products that uh, uh, our customers will enjoy. 
So we continue to develop that, but also what, what I see as a I mean, tremendous potential as we do that, uh, we are making an impact on local communities. We are actually taking this ocean bound plastic uh, that you saw in the video out of uh, Haiti. And, uh, and, uh, and it's amazing. We've created 2000 jobs in this, uh, in this country, people taken out of poverty, uh, being offered an opportunity and helping us actually to uh, address the problem of the uh, plastic in the ocean. And we are using that into our cartridges. So wh what I'm trying to explain is that uh, in parallel to uh, yeah, think different, developing pilots, continuing to expand our recy uh, recycling and su sustainability tools, taking the learning along the way. Now we have uh, also developed uh, a lot more knowledge a lot more proof points that allow us to move to the next phase, which is scaling. Uh, so we have commercialized, uh, started to commercialize the products in France. We are looking at what, where we can expand this. Uh, the same with the, the, the process uh, in Germany. We are looking at where, what we can do in, the, in North America already. So now it's, uh, it's almost like a virtuous cycle that we have uh, 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 developed in order to uh, uh, really transform completely the portfolio and our entire uh, uh, supply chain process. Thank you, Guillaume. Guillaume, we've started getting some questions in, so I'm going to merge yeah. them into our conversation. One was around consumer, you know, um, how do you get them along to support you? You mentioned we wanted 300 people to come to the pilot, oversubscribe, and yes, I am personally aware about them too. So I would ask you a question to synthesize this before we get into challenges. What was the most intriguing revelation you had from a consumer behavior perspective, right? Because there are various schools of thought, something, hey, the tree huggers will pay for sustainability, whereas nobody else will pay for sustainability. There are like schools of thought and it, the jury is still out how it's going to pan out. But as, I mean, you don't have to go by opinions and philosophies and surveys and stuff. You have lived this journey and you are living this journey. What were some of the most intriguing surprises for you where either you hope this would happen and that happened and you had given it low probability or you are like wow we never thought about it these guys just came on board and they think differently um it's it's a uh, uh, I, I think it's a it's a great question i think uh, uh you mentioned it i mean when we started the pilot i was uh, i was a little bit anxious will we have enough people uh, choosing to opt in. Why would they do that? I mean, it's a change. We are not sure. We are, we are, uh, we're just telling them, don't worry, you're going to get the same quality. And we had to stop the, <laughs> the opt-in process because otherwise we would have had too many people. So that was one good surprise. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, the, the other thing is that at the beginning, when we started to say, hey, we uh, this product in, in, in France, the engineer said, ah, we cannot reuse so many materials. It's impossible. Um, and, and, and they came back amazingly with, uh, 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 we've got, I mean, this product has close to, uh, 80% uh, recycled and reused materials and with the quality being absolutely, um, on par with a, a completely new cartridge being manufactured. And a year before, it was almost seen as impossible to do. Um, uh, so that was a surprise. And then when we see the, along the way with our customers, when we, we, they see the performance of the product, they see the, how it's being done. They, we even actually invited our customers to visit the factory so that they see how uh, recycling works, uh, how you produce a sustainable cartridge uh, with all the process of getting the cartridge back, the used one, and then uh, 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 analyzing them, processing them, they are absolutely amazed. And, and you see their reaction, they say, okay, now I understand. I understand why it's so complex. I understand uh, um, um, uh, why we need companies like HP with their capabilities to develop solutions. And uh, I saw that from customers, even from uh, regulators and officials uh, visiting the factory, they were absolutely amazed about what it takes to do it at scale. And, uh, and that was, they were 
I mean, sharing openly quite, quite some support to this. And uh, also you feel absolutely encouraged. You have your customers actually understanding what it takes and being pleased to contribute. You have officials saying, wow, this is great. You are creating jobs uh, as a result of that. And um, we didn't realize that it, it would take such a technology, such a process to make it at, at this scale. So we feel extremely encouraged. We have, uh, we have customers really uh, appreciating and asking us, what can we do more? We would like to understand when I use your cartridge, how many, uh, uh, how much carbon emission have we contribute to, uh, to uh, reduce? When we use your paper, how many uh, trees have we saved from deforestation? Uh, it, it's, it's actually uh, making me uh, feel extremely encouraged that we are moving in that action where we can, um, we can create business success and customer success and also um, social and community success. Uh, uh, but it takes a very different approach. No, that makes sense. Guillaume, I can see the proud papa thinking about the impact uh, he and his organization is making. You know, it's a very nirvana kind of a state when your customers start caring for you. You know, typically it's, you know, a transactional relation. But when you get to a customer caring for you, there is nothing better than that for a product, for a product company. Um, well, we're going to run out of time, but I want to get one question in, and I'm going to merge it with a few questions that I have gotten uh, on the side. No successful journey is fulfilled without any hurdles, pitfalls, breakers, uh, whatever you want to call them. How was your journey and your organization's journey around the challenges? And I'm merging a couple of questions that came in around how did you bring the stakeholders along on this journey? And if we have a little bit of time, then I'm going to ask you one more question. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question because uh, I think you have realized with my accent that I'm, I'm not Native American, but probably from, from, from France. And I quoted this example about, uh, about uh, the, the the, the product in France, manufactured in France. And I've been repeating inside the company, there's nothing personal about this. <laughs> there's nothing personal. It's not about, um, yeah, the choice of, the, of, this, uh, of this site was very rational. We had a recycling center. We made it a recycling and manufacturing site because it was a way to uh, reduce cost because we could do it on one side instead of shipping it uh, all over the, the globe and having to incur huge uh, logistic costs. So uh, the reason I'm saying this is because I had to uh, convince uh, uh, the uh, uh, enterprise leadership team, my CEO about the merits of uh, uh, making those change. I would say, with Enrique uh, being very focused on making uh, a company uh, more sustainable and setting very ambitious goals for the companies, it was it was relatively uh, it was very easy, I would say, because uh, it was kind of supporting his goals. Uh, but the entire organization, making sure everybody would understand, would see the same thing as I, I and a few others in my organization at, at the beginning were seeing. Yeah, it takes um, it takes some communication. It takes, but I think those pilots a lot a lot uh, to uh, prove the case. Uh, we saw the result. We saw customers telling us. We saw uh, the process working. We saw the concrete outputs. It's not anymore a goal in the future. And in fact, I want to say that um, the most important aspect of it is that. There's a lot of companies, including including HP, you might think, uh, the audience might think, well, you, you, you speak a lot, but how much are you doing? And um, in fact, um, I thought we were doing a lot, but uh, it was not necessarily visible as much. And But when you get into these concrete changes that I just ex uh, 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 said as an example, it's not anymore about talking, it's actually changing, it's actually actions. And your organization, the stakeholders, become resonate with that because it's not anymore about talking. So it's, it's, they see the concrete changes that are happening. They see the products. They see the process changing. They see the manufacturing uh, changing. It's um, so uh, it, it becomes more convincing. In fact, so 
I think that that would be that would be my answer to to that. It, it's it's not easy, but my advice is really focus on your actions. Yeah, not hey, communication is good, but communication should be the cherry on the cake uh, based on your actions, not the other way around. Thank you, Guillaume. I'm going to quickly summarize it before I say thank you and bye to you. So the takeaway for me is that sustainability has to be sustainable. Otherwise, it's not going to stick. It has to make business sense. Build an inspiring story to get your people and your customers behind it. It's nirvana when the customers come behind you. And then finally, make it tangible. Don't, don't just talk about that. So with Guillaume this, I want to thank you. This is That's truly an inspiring nice. story. You know, I have become a fan of this journey. I'm personally a very, very happy customer on how your products uh, are coming out. It's just beautiful. And thanks again for coming and sharing this inspiring story with uh, all of our guests. Um, thank you, Guillaume. But I should have said one more thing, which is um, you've been an important part of, of this journey. And uh, you've been extremely instrumental, uh, you and, uh, um, and and the journey team. So I'm very thankful. And uh, we have now a, a, a close friendship. And I appreciate that. And I really appreciate, uh, I, I mean it when I say this, you've been part of this, of this journey. So you're, you're part of this success. So thank you so much. Thank you, Guillaume. With this, um, I would like to introduce our next guest, uh, Dominic, who leads Pearl Labs in Europe, and uh, he will be talking to Benedict. So what we heard from Guillaume was, how do you actually create this inspiring story and get everybody along? But we also know if you want to make a change, we got to measure it. Otherwise, it just does not stick. And what uh, two of our next guests are going to talk about something very tactical, very tangible, and something that we can do and put a stake in the ground, which is measurable, non-controversial, not an opinion, but facts. So with this, I'm going to invite Dominic and Benedict. Guys, thank you for joining. Please take it. Thank you so much, Bharat. And uh, yeah, great uh, to get the ball on our side of the court. And uh, yeah, would like to start off with uh, introducing um, Benedict, who is uh, yeah, working um, since over eight years now for Polaris Partners, who is one of our, um, let's say, core partners whenever we tackle um, product design in the area of sustainability. Um, great that Benedict could make it. And uh, maybe we'll start with asking Benedict to give a quick introduction about himself uh, before we move further into the topic. I'm not sure if we have lost Benedict. All right, I'm sure Benning is on his way back. Um, maybe try to reach the time and I uh, take over a bit the introduction um, part until Benedict is back. Um, so we brought in Benedict Care, who's uh, over eight years with uh, Polaris Partners, as I said, and is doing their uh, multifold of projects, but uh, overall focus is uh, usually, let's say, industrial and automotive clients, um, where they help to do two things. And uh, he can explain later um, why these two things go so well together. But what they do a lot is they help uh, their clients get transparency in classic projects, more from a cost and value perspective. And of course, in the last year, what they have been developing and focusing a lot is also getting transparency into the CO2 footprint. And uh, this is uh, where they're very strong in, where they build their own tool. And this is why we wanted to talk to him if he hopefully comes uh, back to us and there he is perfect I, I, i'm very sorry i somehow i uh, i moved to the to the original room again 
<laughs> so, uh, no worries, no worries. Uh, so I just gave a quick introduction about you and uh, products, so please, uh, you can take over and uh, do it better than me. Okay, uh, so I don't know what you said uh, already. But um, so for me, uh, I'm senior advisor at Polaris Partner. Um, what I'm doing there is um, uh, with well, value analysis and benchmarking projects. But my main focus or my main task is the de development of tools, uh, which includes all kinds of tools, but uh, is especially uh, our tool Polaris Costing, uh, which is also used for uh, CO2 uh, emission calculation. Uh, Polaris Partner as, um, as company, uh, we are consultants in the manufacturing industry. Uh, which uh, includes for us um, automotive mainly, um, uh, aerospace uh, clients, uh, mechanical engineering, also energy sector, and um, uh, additionally uh, medical uh, technologies and pharma, uh, pharmaceuticals. And um, in this uh, essential part of our work is analysis and calculation of products. Um, and this means for us, on one hand, uh, things like shirt costing, um, uh, understanding how a product uh, works, uh, and uh, in especially, uh, so in this case, the, the analysis also of the CO2 emissions, which, um, yeah, which are created when uh, producing a specific product. Sounds good. So maybe I think the first question I would like to start is, um, when you look at, at uh, products or at uh, overall portfolios, how do you look at sustainability? What is what is the angle you take? Because it's a it's a broad topic, right? So um, we we actually see sustainability since we have a history in uh, in cost uh, analysis. Uh, we see um, sustainability as an uh, additional dimension when doing decisions. So uh, what we try to do is uh, get um get it quant quantifiable so um uh, some of the uh, of uh, sustainability goals uh, or esg goals in general are always um, a bit qualitative and um what we try to do is um let's say put, put a euro or dollar on uh, on co2 and uh, that makes it quantifiable for us and that's also showing us the trade-off um if we are going to be more sustainable, what does it cost, cost us? And um, we heard also um, from, from the session before, um, uh, you, need to, you need the clients to go along. Um, and they will go along uh, a, a good way, but uh, they will not go along all the way. Um, so that's, that's a very uh, important topic. And so the big question is always, where do I start? Um, and uh, that's what we're trying to do. So then maybe it would be interesting to also understand how is it or why is it that a company like Polarix that is, uh, let's say, highly specialized in design to value, uh, optimizing complex products and cost analysis, how, when and why did you start integrating CO2 as a dimension? So first, uh, we initially started or the first idea was from one of our partners, uh, actually eight years ago. Um, and uh, he said, okay, well, we already have all the information we need. We, uh, we are already modeling how many materials do we need? What, is, what are the specific raw materials we need? What are the processes that, uh, that, are, that are needed? How long does it take? Uh, which people uh, do we need for it? Uh, what is the, the energy consumption? And all of that we already do for, for our cost analysis. And so we said, why can't we just put the CO2 value in there uh, and get it um, and um, and then we, we have an additional outcome and have this additional dimension of the CO2. Uh, so eight years ago, um, we, we ran the idea with our clients and uh, it was not that much of an interest, but um, I would say around three years ago, we started a development partnership with some of our clients um, uh, with our Polarix costing tool. And there, there were several different topics and uh, only one of them was CO2. And um, suddenly there was a, a very quick shift in focus and uh, not only from our development partners, but also from, um, uh, from outside. Uh, suddenly the, everyone talked about a CO2, but nobody really knew um, where, where they are standing and how they should go on. And um, that's where the initial idea from eight years ago uh, came back on and we said, okay, now's the time to do it. And um, so th this 
we need to just put the CO2 value on it uh, was a bit harder than we initially uh, anticipated. Um, but with a lot of research and uh, a lot of good work, um, we uh, we built a very good uh, uh, tool by now. So then three years ago, you were explaining that the interest, let's say, risks uh, significantly for this, uh, let's say, dimension when looking and analyzing products. Um, now, when you talk to different clients from different industries, um, do you see a different level of maturity when it comes to uh, measuring sustainability in CO2 footprint or? Well, I would say um, uh, not, not really in the maturity. I would say there is a large difference because um, most are at the beginning. Uh, so there are some really large goals which, which are being set. Um, but um, for for many uh, clients, it, it is uh, it is a journey where they, where they are uh, at the beginning. But uh, the difference, or the main difference between clients, is um, how much they focus on it. So um, some just want to get an initial idea: where do I stand? What is happening with the CO two? Will this be important for me in the future? Um, others say, okay. Let's let's do this, and uh, we we are starting a department which um, uh, just uh, just does CO two emissions and um, uh, go with much more resources in there. And I think that's the that's the main uh, difference between uh, the maturity and the clients. But um, I would say it's something where everyone is um, is really at the uh, at the beginning stage. So then when they are rather still, let's say, starting this journey um, for a lot of your clients, what do you see is the, the biggest challenges they face to get going on this uh, topic that everybody agrees is so important? The main, uh, the main uh, problem is uh, first knowing where you stand. Because um, if you want to set goals, and um, most of the time goals are something like uh, we want to have half of our emissions uh, in, in CO2, and um, you can do that, but uh, only if you know where you stand at the moment. Yeah. And um, uh, and that's that's something because um, most uh, most people, most companies didn't uh, didn't look at it uh, up up to some years ago. Uh, no one knows where um, uh, or how much uh, CO two uh, everywhere is. I mean, there there are some obvious uh, parts where you can say, okay, most of it will be there. Um, but uh, they don't have the, the general overview, and uh, so they don't yet know where to start, uh, which are the parts uh, which we should pick out, um, and also where are the, the most efficient levers. And if I say most efficient levers, not only where can I um, have the, um, the most, uh, or where can I uh, save the most uh, the most CO2 emissions, but also where can I do it efficiently in terms of cost and also quality and other aspects I want to to see in it in my product. So then, what I'm hearing is um, it comes down to when we optimize products that uh, CO2 is just another let's say thing to balance out, uh, as it was before with cost, quality, product function fulfillment, and now we have to add CO2. Or how would you describe that? Uh, yeah, you can you can say it, but uh, with CO2, um, there is uh, another um, problem, uh, I would say, because it's um, it's very hard to to give it an, an actual um, uh, value in in terms of euros. Because um, okay, we have uh, several uh, emission trading systems um, starting or uh, or in place um, where we can say okay, uh, I don't know the. Uh, price at the moment for CO2 is at around 60, 70 euros per ton. Um, but uh, it, this doesn't actually need to match my uh, my my company's uh, goals. So I could say um, uh, I, for my, I as a company uh, want to have um, a, a specific uh, or especially green company. And then I don't want to just go with the default or with the standard values, uh, which are uh, which I can uh, do, but I want to do more. And um, so giving out this um, or first defining my strategic goals um, is um, is a step to, that I uh, only need to do firstly. And um, also to, to define that, I also need to have an understanding of my product portfolio and um, 
what my what my product actually um, how green they act actually are. So, w would you expect that um, going forward with um, let's say legislations and governments uh, putting more and more rules? Uh, for us in Europe, for example, the CO2 border tax is, is a big topic. So we will see more and more of this. Do you think it will make it easier for companies to put a value on CO2 or price tech? Well, it it gives, uh, I would say it gives a, a border where uh, where you can say, okay, that's that's a value. Um, I wouldn't say that's, that's the value. And um, I think um, if if you were talking about sustainability in a company, we don't want uh, to do the bare minimum. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, I think it's important um, that it's not always about um, or uh, the, the the general idea is that um, uh, CO two neutrality costs money, and yeah. that that's true for many parts, but it's not always true. And um, I think that's a very important message that uh, you can do, for example, technical um, uh, technical innovations or not only innovations, just changes, uh, which uh, are good for CO2 emissions and good for um, for your costs. So it's not always a uh, not always a trade off. And uh, also you have the possibility to have, for example, on one hand, perhaps um, uh, significantly less cost with a bit higher CO2 emissions, but on the other side, uh, it's the other way around and you have a significantly less CO2 emissions with only a bit higher costs. So it's it's the combination of the right um, uh, of the right levers to get to get an overall um, good value. So I don't think uh, we should have a look at too much at the um, at the framework we're we are giving mm -hmm. uh, we are getting, but uh, more on uh, what can we do to to improve our product overall? Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So, would you say that um, the companies that you see or you work with are they still tr struggling to make those trade-off decisions or to come uh, to a let's say balance on where they feel comfortable on making the trade-offs? Um, yes. So not for all, but um, uh, s several uh, are still uh, in this. Um, uh, yeah, in the in this um, are still working in the way that they are uh, saying we, we want to do a qualitative decision. So we um, uh, we know okay, we have a specific idea. The idea um, costs us I don't know a euro per um, per product, and uh, will save us uh, that much uh, CO two. And they will say okay, uh, that's good or that's bad, but they won't say um, CO2 is for me an equivalent of that much, that many euros. And um, that's not uh, not yet done, uh, or it's not broadly done. And we're, of course, uh, having a clear baseline and transparency, not only on cost, but also on CO2, should actually help them to make better decisions in that regard, no? not only better decisions but also faster decisions but because uh it's not uh, not always a good idea to go with every decision through all um uh, up to ceo level um, um with a decision if you have a clear uh, clear way of how to decide uh, those things then uh, it should um, should not only make the decisions better but um, also faster okay understood so then maybe can you explain to us a little bit um, how does it actually work? How can we calculate the CO2 footprint from a complex technical product? Mm -hmm. So um, mainly we, um, I, I would say we um, differentiate between mechanic products and electronic products um, because uh, for the electronic product, we have much more um, uh, influence through for the electronic products. We have much more influence uh, through the electronic uh, parts, which, which are put on the PCBAs. Um, where we need to um, uh, to identify or to um, uh, to calculate the the value of the uh, specific parts in um, in the mechanic products, we um, basically have the, the combination of uh, all raw materials, all um, processes, uh, all machines that that are needed for the processes, um, which we basically put together. So you uh, you put together what um, uh, what you need to produce your product and the, at the end. And um, there's 
is always the question of how detailed do you want to do it so you can do it uh, on a tier one tier two tier three level um, and by doing that you uh, get a better idea of uh, where the where the numbers are coming from um, and then you take uh, take the specific machines and the times and say okay um, or you know how much uh, energy the, the machine is consum uh, consuming uh, especially electricity and natural gas uh, in terms of co2 and um, putting all of this together gives you gives you a total co2 number for uh, for your product um, what I think what's also important there is um, talking about the detail level um, on one hand you can with, with your actual product go very down uh, very deep down into the the product um, with the actual uh, used material you can also go very deep down so uh, you could calculate the, the aluminium down from the mine um, question is uh, why why would i do that or uh, do i need to do that because where does my influence end and that's an, uh, always a very important question um, because uh, it's it's nice to know that uh, my products are um, uh, have a very high CO2 emission because of the uh, aluminium oxide, uh, which is uh, uh, somewhere mined, and um, then I don't uh, uh, can uh, can't influence it, and then I stand there and say, okay, great, uh, I have CO2 emissions, but I can't do anything about it. Um, so it's important to say how detailed do I want to go into my calculation, and what are the parts I can uh, I can change. And for a PCBA, for example, it would more be uh, the design or, or the layout of my PCB, um, perhaps integration of uh, functions um, uh, and uh, things like that, uh, but normally not um, where is my chip produced. Understood. So, but I think it's still it's interesting to see and understand uh, with the example you made on, on the aluminum supply chain how different supply chains um, might have a different influence on the on the CO2 level, no? especially with uh, everything that's going on right now, disrupting all the supply chains. Yeah. Um, so, well, uh, aluminum, I think, is a, is a good example for that because uh, you have a very, uh, not only different supply chains where um, uh, things like uh, the electricity mix is important. For example, in uh, China, you have a lot more uh, coal energy um, than you would have uh, in most of, uh, of Europe. Um, then there's the additional question, which is always a bit taken out if you're talking about CO2 emissions. Uh, what is a, what is uh, with nuclear energy? Uh, is it green or is it not? Um, but um, that that's one important part. But for uh, for the production, also is important which um, uh, which uh, processes are actually used because uh, you have a very different. Um, uh, old and modern um, approaches uh, when producing aluminium and uh, you can actually um, save a lot of, uh, of energy um, already in how you're producing it and then is the question how much uh, co2 does the energy actually um, uh, produce when uh, when producing so there are um, uh, for aluminium i think it's around 20 percent difference uh, if you're having a modern um, uh, a modern uh, process or an old process uh, in terms of uh, uh, energy com uh, electricity consumption and uh, this already gives you a very high um, high lever so do you see then also um, companies already using this uh, your tool or similar tools when they are assessing um, potential suppliers because they are actually analyzing what would it mean to my supply chain and the co2 footprint uh, the supplier would bring to my overall um let's say balance sheet of co2 yes um, absolutely so um we are doing it for for our clients and our clients are um, uh, who are using um, our tool are doing it themselves and um it's um i think for for most of the parts uh, we are at the moment um uh, in a in a stage where everyone is assessing what um what the impacts are um, especially in the in the current situation, uh, supply chains is um, there are other topics which are very important for for many clients, um, and um, for it's um, it's at the moment a stage where most of them are assessing where can I change, um, and uh, that's especially if you're looking for example in the aerospace area, uh, it's very hard to change a supplier or to change a material. Um, 
and uh, that's that's something where uh, where everyone is looking at the moment. Um, where can I change, and where do I have the most impact when I change? Okay, understood. But then I think it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's also it's a, it's a logical uh, way of analyzing CO two, quite similar to a cost analysis, as we understood. Um, but still, it sounds rather complex and requires a lot of information. So let's say we're talking about a, a medium complex product, let's say, for example, a small electric engine. How long would you actually say uh, it takes to do such analysis? How long does a company need to uh, wait for it? Or how much uh, resources should they be prepared to invest uh, if they want to go down that road? Well, for, for a small, um... A small engine, uh, electrical engine. I, I would say let's talk about um, two days or something like that. But uh, it always depends on uh, what information do you already have. Uh, if all all the information are there, then it's not a problem. But um, uh, normally uh, there are questions like, uh, if we're talking about an engine, uh, where is the copper coming from? Uh, do I use recycled copper uh, and so on? And uh, if I have all this information, I can just fill in the numbers uh, more or less but um, uh, most of the time there is a bit of research um, uh, around it um, uh, needed especially if i don't have a, a very strict specification um, then I, I would need to do additional research and um, and then it's the same as uh, as i said before it's always a question how detailed do i do it um, so do i do I only look at uh, what's what's important for me, where I can change, or uh, do I really go down uh, the, the supply chain? And would you say from the conversations you're having with uh, companies looking at this, are there any general trends that you would see or anything that you would expect to happen in the next five years uh, regarding how this is done or how it will be done in the future? Um, what, what we see at the moment is uh, that uh, many OEMs are actually um, uh, wanting more information from their suppliers. So um, in the tier one, tier two level, uh, we actually see that um, they not only have the, um, the, the problem that from, uh, from their ESG points out, uh, they want to have a more sustainable product, but also they are uh, forced to to give out more information about how much um, CO2 emissions they are producing. Um, uh, so that's one important aspect. Um, uh, not only the uh, I, I want to have lower uh, lower CO2 emissions, but also uh, my clients want that. Um, I think that's one important part. And um, on the other hand, um, it's uh, it will be um, a constant journey because it's not only um, the, the process is changing, it's the material um, materials changing, and uh, also the processes to produce the raw materials um, uh, are also changing. And it's, um, it's a, a topic which is um, everywhere in the supply chain. And um, additionally, with the current uh, state of, um, of supply chains, um, they are changing a lot. Um, and I think that's, that's something that, um, that will after after all all of the supply chains have settled, then it will be um, a question: What, um, how is this used to to do it uh, in general? Um, different in the in the future, uh, especially also in um, uh, things like uh, do I source only locally? Um, and yeah, then then is the question: um, If I source locally, do I actually have an advantage in the CO two emissions? So maybe as uh, one of the last questions as we're approaching the end, um, are there any, let's say, examples that you could share or best practices of um, companies that you work with, what they do particularly well when addressing the CO2 footprint and optimizing it? Or are there any uh, personal highlights that you could share with us from doing that kind of analysis? So uh, for, for me, my personal highlight is definitely uh, if you uh, actually have uh, such a situation as I uh, described earlier, where you have um, a, a technical improvement or a technical change um, where you say, OK, um, not only do we have better CO2 emissions, but the question is always if you say, OK, we have an idea how to improve the CO2 emissions, it's always the question, OK, and what does it cost me? And if you're then in the situation can say it, it doesn't cost you a dime, it, uh, it actually uh, improves your cost. Um, that, that's always uh, a really rewarding moment. Um, 
and um, yeah, what, what are um, clients uh, actually doing uh, very well? Um, I would say um, uh, that that they starting, that they are starting, that they are um, looking at their uh, product portfolio and uh, picking out which are the parts where I want to um, do perhaps a lighthouse project where I want to um, uh, start uh, reducing my CO2 emissions. All right, great. I think we're perfectly on time. Um, thank you so much, Benedict, uh, for taking the time, sharing with us all the insights uh, on your tool. My pleasure. And uh, I think it's my pleasure to hand over to uh, Alex Liu, our global managing partner, um, for the next part of the session. So thank you so much.